Now let's uh, consider how superposition works in the frequency domain. Now in some respects superposition works exactly as you would, would think it would, very much like how we did in the time domain. So for example, here's just a circuit where we want to find this phasor current I1 using superposition. So if we were going to do that, we would basically zero out each of these two sources and then solve for those two partial circuits. So let's just do that. I've got 10 at a phase angle of 90 degrees. That becomes J 10 volts. I've got 2 at 0 degree phase angle amps. So that becomes 2 amps for an, in rectangular form. And so if I zero out one and then the other, I'll get two partial circuits. I'll get this one. And I'll get this one. So in this case, if we were to solve for each of these, these would be basically pretty, pretty straightforward to solve. I'd want to first find I1 prime due to the, 10, the J10 volt source, and then find I1 double prime due to the two amp source. And so if we do that, in this case, this is simply going to be Ohm's law. So in this case, I1 prime will just be equal to J10 divided by 5 plus J10 and that'll be equal to 0 0.8 plus J0.4 amps. Down here this is going to be essentially 2 amps flowing through this capacitor which then gets split up by current division and so in this case I can write that and what I'll have is that I1 double prime will be equal to 5 over 5 plus J10 times 2, which will be equal to 0 0.4 minus J 0 0.8 amps. And now if I wanted to add those two components together, then what I would get is that I1 is equal to I1 prime plus I1 double prime which will be equal to 1.2 minus J 0.4 amps. So there's nothing particularly special or interesting or unique about this problem. It's just standard superposition using the same principles. We're just doing everything with complex math. But it turns out that there are certain types of problems where superposition is in fact the really only way to solve them. And this is where we see some of the real power of superposition. As we mentioned before, superposition is a great tool for determining how each source contributes to a current or voltage. But in some cases, it actually gives us the ability to work a problem that under normal circumstances we couldn't work. Let's look at some examples of that. What if we had the following problem? 
what we'd like to do is we would like to find the value of IT. What is that current equal to? Now at first glance you look at this and say, oh, well, not a problem. We'll just do this with phaser analysis. There's only one problem. We can't solve it that way because I've got two sources with two different values of omega. I've got omega equal 10 radians per second for the top source and omega equal 20 radians per second for the bottom source. One of the fundamental requirements of phaser analysis is that all of the sources in the circuit have to have the same value of omega. So in this case, when you look at it, I clearly cannot apply phaser analysis. Which value of omega do I pick? I can't pick them both. So you look at that and say, we'll have to do this in the time domain. Well, you could. That would be the hard way. Another way you could do this is to say, what about superposition? Let's try applying superposition to this problem and see if that gives us a way to solve it. I'm going to split this into two separate problems. The first problem, I'm going to zero out the bottom source and I'm going to assume omega is equal to 10 radians per second. So this becomes 10 at a phase angle of 0 volts is 10 volts. 1 ohm resistance, and in this case, J omega L will be equal to J 1 ohms. And so I've got I 1 prime, I should say I prime, excuse me, and in this case I prime will be equal to 10 over 1 plus J 1 will be equal to 5 minus J5 amps will be equal to 7.071 at a phase angle of minus 45 degrees amps. So that's the first problem due to the top source. Now I'm going to zero out the top source and examine the current due to the bottom source. So in this case, this is 5 at a phase angle of 0 volts only now omega is equal to 20 radians per second. So what's different? Well, the 1 ohm resistance doesn't change, but the impedance of the inductor does. Now it's J2 ohms. And so now we ask ourselves, what is I double prime? And I double prime is equal to 5 over 1 plus J2, which is equal to 1 minus J2 amps, which is equal to 2.236 at a phase angle of minus 63.43 degrees amps. So now I want to figure out what the current is going to be by adding those two partial currents together. So, how do we do that? Now here's where a lot of students will make a mistake. They'll say, okay, Dr. Holman, I know exactly how to do this. I is equal to I1 prime, probably I prime plus I double prime. Just add those together. I'll get 6 minus J7. And there's my current. There's only one problem. That doesn't work. You can't add together two phasers if those phasers are based on different values of omega. This answer, this current phaser, assumed that omega was equal to 10 radians per second. This one assumed that the current phaser was equal to 20 radians per second. You cannot add them in the frequency domain. So, I can't say I is equal to I prime plus I double prime. It won't work. So superposition won't work in the frequency domain in this particular problem because I've got sources of the different values of omega. But can I still make superposition work? Yes, only not in the frequency domain. So I can't do this. I can't say 
i is equal to i prime plus i double prime. That won't work, but this will. i t is equal to i prime of t plus i double prime of t. In the time domain it will work. Let's go to the time domain for these two. i prime of t will be equal to 7.071 cosine 10t minus 45 degrees amps. Over here, I double prime t is equal to 2.236 times cosine of 20t minus 63.43 degrees amps. So notice the sinusoids have the different values of omega that the sources have. And now I add them together. Now I simply say that I of t is equal to 7.071 times cosine 10 of t minus 45 degrees plus 2.236 cosine 20 t minus 63.43 degrees amps. And there's my solution. So I can't add the partial currents in the frequency domain, but I can absolutely add them in the time domain. And here's where superposition can be applied. So now instead of having to go through and solve this using a differential equation, I can still solve it using phasers. But I have to separate out the sources that have different values of omega and then add them back together in the time domain. Now the nice thing about this is we can extend this idea even further. So let's say, for example, I had this for the problem. What if instead of 5 cosine 10 of t, the second source was 5 volts DC? It was a DC source. So I've got a sinusoidal source and a DC source. Not a problem. This part remains exactly the same. Doesn't change. This part over here now becomes a DC circuit, 5 volts DC, which means in this case, for a DC circuit, the inductor becomes a wire. So now what is I double prime? Well, in this case, it's not really even a phaser anymore. It's simply I T double prime, which is just equal to 5 divided by 1 is equal to 5 amps DC. And so now this becomes my second portion that I add to this equation. And so this equation up here now becomes 7.071 cosine 10 of t minus 45 degrees for this part plus 5 amps. So now I've got a solution that includes both a sinusoidal component and a DC component, all combined together. So here's where superposition really gives us a tool that allows us to work problems that normally we would not be able to work. Superposition is, does it, isn't something we want to use in every single problem. But in problems where you're mixing an AC with a DC source or mixing sinusoidal sources with different frequencies, superposition is a tool that will let you solve it. So very nice, very powerful, very flexible tool. And here is where superposition really shines when we're looking at AC analysis. All right. Next time we'll wrap things up by looking at how we can apply phaser analysis to op-amp circuits.